played. Do you do you want me to do? Do you you want me in the frame to where you can, this is viewable? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's yeah, that's fine. Um, in, in all fairness, I am focusing because I'm aware that. Internet can also affect the quality of video. I mean, really, the audio portion of this is the most important, and I hear you perfectly fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So um, I wanted to to have this be a moment for you to tell your story, lift your voice, share your message, and then I had a series of questions for you um, to help facilitate that. If you didn't already have anything set, so I turned the the stage to you uh jenny gunn thank you so much for your time you. and uh as we talked about this a thousand times but yes this exhibition is supposed to be a platform for the transgender community uh using art and design as a platform uh for the community to tell us who they are in their voice and light and how we as, as fellow humans um uh, can be better allies or comrades i think i you know i mean I guess my story, my personal story, isn't nearly as important as how I got here. And, and what I mean by that, and I talk about this when I do business consulting, and I, I rip this line off of a famous business consultant. It's about profits, people, and processes. And transitioning is kind of the same way, except it's about cost yourself as a person and other people and the process and buying into the process and understanding why you're doing it or why why you do anything whether it's an art project or you know um going back to school or whatever i think you need to understand why you're doing it why you're why you're putting your butt in that seat and and for me i spent more of my transition understanding myself rather than getting caught up with surgeries and the physical look. I mean, I, I have transitioned physically in some ways, but it really, to me, I had other, I have other friends that start the same time that have gone through more of the physical side of it, but are miserable. They're not happy because they never got right with themselves. They never, they still haven't bought into the mental side of the process. I'm, and I've known too many trans women, especially do the really big expensive surgeries and you know they've built their body like a ferrari but they still have the old used car brain because they they went to the minimum amount of sessions to get the surgery letter as they did they mailed it in on the mental side and they should have flipped that and so for me i think one of the reasons that i'm in in such a good mental place now is because I did that work on the front end. I, I'm a big fan of therapy. I'm a big fan of working through stuff, experimenting with your social game, um, you know, figuring out what works for you. And for me, I isolated some things in my life. I, at the beginning of my transition, I did not date uh, romantically at all. Um, I did about basically of celibacy. I didn't, you know, I mean, my even my sexual side of my life got put on hold because I was like, I need to just concentrate on me and I can't do that if I got another person. And since I was single at the time when I began my transition, um, it helped a lot. I mean, it, it, to me, those first two years is built a foundation in me to where even if I have something where I went, Oh crap, I can take it in stride. And, 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 at the beginning of my transition, I could look at a coffee cup and just start crying and did not know why. I mean, some of it was the hormones. <laughs> I mean, getting used to estrogen and that sort of thing, you know. The, I mean, when, you, when you've been had testosterone, even if it's poisoning through your life, it does numb you to certain things because it is a steroid, too. And getting in tune with that estrogen, emotional narrative, um, and just being an emotional, passionate person... I was just like learning to walk or ride a bike again. I mean, it literally was rebuilding. And I was like, uh, you know, I, that was a big, big um, concentrated effort on my part. Um, because of it, I can really accomplish anything I want now. Um, I don't believe there's anything that I take on that I can't do. It might be a Pollyanna hopefulness in me, but at the same time, everything I've attempted 
typically has done pretty well, you know, uh, especially since I've come to Charlotte and uh, Charlotte, North Carolina has been very good to me, um, you know, and, but I think also being receptive to experiences, reaching across the aisle, so to speak, and being around people that maybe aren't pro trans, uh, which I've done, you know, being in running political circles where I've sat down with Republicans, gone to their meetings, you know, didn't ask them to come to mine. I went to theirs, you know, and be open to experiences, you know, when I have, you know, art friends and, and people that are willing to make social change, you know, being open to those experiences, not, you know, go, oh, gosh, you know, you know, am I worth interviewing? Well, if they ask me, then I'm going to do it, you know, because, you know, when I meet somebody like yourself, like I met you, you know, almost a year and a half ago, it's been a while, you know, when you came to support group, I think it was 2018. It and was. Gosh, time flies. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, mean, I think this December will be two years that I've known you now. And yeah. what wonderful experiences we shared, you know, and being, oh, you know, when I heard you speak about your project, I was like, oh, I want to get to know this guy. He seems cool, you know, it just, I like what he's got going on. And I don't know whether I'll fit or not, but I at least want to, you know, build a, you know, uh, a, a friendship and, a, and an understanding of what makes him tick, what makes this guy want to help my community what what why is he reaching against gender lines to do something like that which i think is just fabulous and so i think when you open yourself up to experiences and and you're willing to try new stuff because why not we're all going through a second puberty a, a, a second awakening or birth you know don't do the same old things that you did the previous you know uh, life you know why do that you know and so i've never set any boundaries for myself as far as if i if i feel like it's something comfortable that i can do then i'm just going to do it if if somebody says i want you to set up a benefit burlesque show or something like that i just go and do it you know i just i don't i don't i don't ever think that there is a barrier to what i'm doing and so um, but I think it's also served me well. It's endeared me to a lot of people. A lot of people used adjectives like brave and 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 glowing. And and I think it's just because I, you know, if I want that acceptance, I want people to treat me with openness. I think that I have to give that back, you know, and um, do it for my community. Do it for all my siblings out there, you know, that are in the LGBT rainbow. And I think you touched on it a little bit, you know, what what pushed you to go into these levels of advocacy? And it sounds like a lot of it kind of just lined up. It was just a matter of getting started. But what pushed? What what was the push? What what made that momentum for you? I think, you know, that started in Texas. And I mean, it really started before that. I mean, uh, for one thing, and, and I won't go into deep details or anything like that, because it's still a very what emotional it, subject. All right. But in 2015, you know, I was a victim of a hate crime and an assault over me being trans. I had just started to come out socially to a select few people, even though the physical part was still pretty far off and pretty inconceivable. Um, it was my introduction to womanhood, and it was an introduction to how dangerous the world is, because the people that assaulted me were nine friends of mine that... Knew, I'd known um, for some for 10 plus years. Actually, I'd let one of them stay in my house and got them a job at one time, you know, and uh, they set me out. I came out to a friend in a moment of weakness. I'd broken up with my wife um, and, uh, and I was kind of explaining why she left me was so I could go on my journey because she has some challenges in her life. And she's like, I know you can't transition and take care of me, so I'm going to go do the right thing. I'm going to let you off the hook. And I told this to a friend, and he, and he was like, like, transition, like, physically transition, like, you're really a woman. And I said, yes. And then I showed him a few pictures on my phone at the time, and he said, well, we should go kick it sometime, you know, and we weren't that far from Springfield, Missouri. And so we went out, and we went back to his lake house, and we were hanging out with a bunch of friends, and I was all in thin mode. And before I knew it, you know, I was by myself with just 
the guys. And I said, well, I feel uncomfortable. Maybe I should go back home. And I got struck with a beer bottle over the head and was assaulted physically and sexually at at a knife point um, for an intern. I don't even know how long. And they were trying to teach me not to be the F word. And, um, and so that was a very brutal, very traumatic thing. Um, but I've come to terms with it. It's a big part of why I did concentrate on my therapy. It wasn't just the transitional, but the unpacking of a lot of things that went on in my life. There's a lot of, a lot of things that kind of have to do with being trans and some of it just happens as this life happens. And, um, so learning to live with stuff like that, learning to live with traumas is one of the driving forces, um, <laughs> for, if people understand um, what it is to live through something like that and then get to the point where you forgive your attackers and realize and it wasn't my fault. It was just ignorance. It was a lesson that the universe put in my lap that I had to go through to make me who I am today, steel, sharp, and steel. And it drives me. It drives me every day. Seeing my sisters of color being slaughtered in wholesale fashion with nobody doing anything. Things of that nature. Um, if anything keeps me up at night, it's that. If it's anything is just the brutality of being trans, openly trans, visibly queer. I'm... It gives me more empathy for people that are visibly different, whether you're a person of color, whether you're visibly queer, you know, visibly, um, you know, disabled, whatever it is that makes you put you in that other box. Um, it's taught me a lot of life lessons, which in turn probably is what drives my activism. It's probably why my activism is so broad <laughs> is that, I see all these issues as related. I see the overall disdain for society towards women in general, just how disposable women are, how objectified they are, and realizing that if they'll do it to their wives and sisters and cousins that are cis and straight and have got all the check boxes, then what chance do I have of normalcy if I don't do something, if I, as a white woman of privilege, don't say something, um, you know, and I have an opportunity and I'm just weird enough to stand out, <laughs> you know, and, and fight, you know, and, and fight in a way that, that isn't in your face is, is, is more like, just get to know me. Let me, let me, let me toe dip in your pool just a little bit. And then, if you can't stand me, tell me that, I'm a big girl. And if you want to know more, and that's how I approached the, the young Republicans, is like I told the president of the young Republicans that, that we were all at a cross-party joint thing at the High Brewery back last summer, and I happened to run into Larry, and I just said, Larry, I would love to come to one of your meetings. I would love, and I, I said, I just would love to come and just sit in and be a guest. And I said, if there's an opportunity for me to do that, I would love that. And here's my card. And I took his card, and he was very gracious, very sweet. Then they happened to leave their bag of goodies behind, or all their paraphernalia and stuff that every little club has. And I was one of the last ones to leave. In fact, I was help, helping the organizer kind of wrap things up. And I saw their little bag there. They'd left. They'd left a little bit earlier than everybody else. And I grabbed the bag because I was afraid the staff might do something to it or just throw it away because they're like, I don't want to bother with this. And I put it in my car. I shot a picture of it. And I had Larry's cell phone number because he gave me his business card. And I said, hey, Larry, I looked online. I saw you all have a meeting tomorrow night. Can I just drop the bag by? He said, yeah. And he said, you might as well stay. I'll buy you a beer. And so we, I went to the meeting the next night. And him and Caroline and a bunch of the young Republicans, we just... We talk, they ask me a lot of questions about, you know, they, we've never had a trans person at one of our meetings that we know of, you know, and so it just, 
and we just talked about normal stuff, you know, and, and just we 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 removed all the barriers and just became human to human. And I think if I ever, I think if you could ever give a young activist or an activist in general that's starting out advice, I think it is try to strip away your barriers first and then try to strip away other people's barriers very slowly, earning their trust. And, you know, I didn't go into the meeting with the intentionality of disturbing their meeting or going in there and acting up or anything like that. I went in there legitimately with my palms up, no arms, no hidden agendas. I just, I just want to know these baby Republicans. And honestly, their meetings weren't really much different than the young Democrats. <laughs> you know, they, they, were, they were meeting in one of these brew pubs and just hanging out and, and just talking about life and their jobs and it was kind of an open, no agenda meeting that night. It was kind of more of a mixer, and it was super chill. We sat out on a patio last summer and just, just were humans. And uh, they had tons of questions, you know, and uh, it was great, you know. And it's easy for me to go to young Democrat meetings, you know, because, you know, they're so progressive. And, you know, it's like the mothership and there's, you know, other LGBT people there. It's not a, it's not a big deal. But and I still I go to those. I'm friends with all those people too. But it's been interesting to go to libertarian meetings and Republican meetings and Rotary clubs and things that are non traditional progressive spaces. You know, outside of the 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 uh, the uh, Equality North Carolina or the HRC galas. Of course, everybody's gonna like it there. I mean, that's that's easy. That's that's a given. That's the home team. You know, and and. Uh, I think that's a big part of my my deal of building bridges is 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 what drives me is to keep what's ha- what happened to me in 2015 from happening as much and really start humanizing what I am and that we're all in the same genome we're all you know like trans people aren't aliens you know i'm not i didn't come in from a mothership or anything like that and and that we're all humans uh, you know when we get past all the physical traits human to human our auras are all the same and so it's just we all have hopes and dreams and aspirations and and things we like and certain pizza flavors we like and it just it, it just is 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 moving that back and that's what drives me is 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 you know, when it's all said and done, I want to leave this world a little bit better than when I found it, and um, which is challenging. Um, you know, and and keeping the spirit up and and not feeling beaten down, you know, and being mindful of of your energy level. And I mean, the things that I take on, the activism that I take on, and the business stuff that I take on. I really have two basic rules that were taught to me by uh, a, um, actually it was a white cis male, right, that taught me this, but he was a phenomenal activist for the LGBT community as an ally. And he did art projects. He had owned art galleries. He was an art entrepreneur and very creative type. And I was having trouble with the Pride organization I was volunteering for back in Texas. And I told him some of the stuff I was going through and some of the political wrangling because, I, you know, I work really hard. So I threaten people that play small ball, you know, that don't go, oh, I don't want my organization to grow that fast. You know, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, you're taking the limelight. And um, there was one gay man in particular that was the vice president of the board that was really backing me. And I finally sat down with this friend of mine and I just said, yeah, this is what I'm going through. And he said, well, Jenny, first of all, he says, that's why I don't do a lot of nonprofit boards. He said, I got two rules with every endeavor I do. He says, just two. He says, it's got to be interesting to me to dr- that's part of my passion. And he says, it can't suck. <laughs> and he said, if you go by those two rules, he said, it will serve you well. Is He said, you are old enough and smart enough to do whatever you want, but follow your passions and don't let every day be a suck day. Don't put up a crap. So if it's not working for you, walk away from it. And then about two weeks after that conversation, I walked away from that board because I just I wasn't I wasn't gelling with with one or two key you know executives on that board. I'm like, obviously they got a different plan. They're not comfortable with me. Why stay? You know, and um, 
you know, so it, 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 it's driven me to pick the, the activisms and the advocacies and the routes in Charlotte. I've been a lot more, I'm not going to say choosy, but I've been more mindful of who's in the room. And is their energy matching up with me? And there, are they adding enough value to my life for me to keep them in my life and be willing to hear their story and vice versa, you know, being open to, they may not, they, I might not be their cup of tea. There's certain LGBT activists in Charlotte that we just, they've talked to me about doing stuff, but they, after we talked a while, hell, they weren't really jiving with me. They didn't, they didn't feel comfortable with me. And um, so we didn't pursue it because I just was honest. I said, I don't feel like we're, 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 diving real well and you're kind of like, yeah yeah we don't really dive with you too much and it's like okay cool you know like i'm busy anyway you know so let's shake your heads and, and, and fist bump and, and and head on down the road you know like the the twirl the world organization or whatever those guys and i are like oil and water and um, they they talk to me on the uh the trans um i had that trans mixer for charlotte pride you know last last year pride week and they were there. They were talking to me about, you know, maybe being involved. And after we conversated, we never had another conversation again because at the end of it, I was like, oh, okay, well, here's some information about the trans community, but um, I don't think we're a fit, you know, and it happens, you know, it, it, you can't take offense to it. You know, it's, it's like Charlotte Pride when I interviewed for coordinator spots, volunteer coordinating spots, I was like, if you guys don't choose me or don't want me to do it, I'm not good. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You know, like I do love being involved with Charlotte pride, but I don't have to be, you know, and, and if it gels, it gels. And if it doesn't, it doesn't, there, there's a time and place for everything. And, um, I think too many young LGBT people take it too personal. I see some of the remarks on Facebook where, yeah, I was with Charlotte pride for a year and they just didn't want to do what I wanted them to do. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's their organization. That's why they got a board. <laughs> and you were a volunteer, you know. I mean, you're not staff. You're not on a board. And, you know, I take it. I put in my suggestions. I put in my work. I put in my stuff with them. But at the end of the day, if they want to make a decision and not do an event or they want to do it a little different way or they want to put it off, it's their money. It's their reputation. It's their brand. You know, if I want to go start up my own Charlotte Pride organization, I can but I'm not on the board. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things. No, that makes total sense. And then real quick, um, gosh, so really you covered everything I was going to ask anyway, but there <laughs> was another question changing directions a little bit. Okay. Was, um, you know, what can, so in all of this, what can be done for, well, for someone who doesn't know anything about the trans community? Because I think also some of that comes from just lack of knowledge of each other. And for someone who doesn't know anything about transgender identity, people, resources, any of the like, you know, what would you be able and willing to share in maybe that regard and, and how people can be an ally in that, in that sense? I think the best thing is to start with the basics and there's so many great resources out there. You have like the transgender law, you know, law group, um, you have glad, um, you know,'s website that has a page just on being a good transgender ally and, and their verbiage on it's very good. Honestly, I like using those third party non-local resources because so many of them have really in-depth things but those two come into mind because the transgender law and it, it's i think it's got a fourth part to its name but it's out of california and um it is a organization that's around kind of like legal issues in the trans community all over the country at transgender law center that's what it is a, a TGLC, I believe is what it is, or TLC, um, yes. but it, but it's been around, for, it's been around a long time. Um, I think, I think some of the stuff that HRC writes about, you know, the different quality organizations 
but you know, one of the things that always struck me, um, when I ran a support group back in Texas or helped facilitate a group, I printed off the GLADS thing right off their website and distributed it in, in meetings, especially to allies that were friends and family that came with a trans person to the group. And I was like, here you go. Just read this. I'll make it easy for you. Just read this. Take it home, you know, and 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 start with the basics. Just understanding that people's pronouns are not their preferred pronouns. If I say my pronouns are she, her, just take my word for it. Practice it. Yeah, you might slip every once in a while, but just take my word for it that I am a woman and that my my pronouns are she, her, they, them, and that's cool. You know, just you know, it. it, it but I think a lot of people base a lot of their stuff on their belief system and if their belief system allows it to be open and progressive you know whether it's religious or non-religious or political or but their core beliefs their what makes them them i am if they have more open-mindedness in their core belief system it, and, and i think that's why i get more acceptance in progressive circles and non-lgbt progressive um, it's because they're open to it. And so I think if I was going to tell an ally anything and be like, just be open, just be open. Like I was at the beginning of my activism is just be open to experiences. Don't, don't judge me on what you think I used to be or fetishize any part of my body or don't get caught up what I was born with and what my original factory equipment was and what I don't have now or what I do have now, put the genitals to the side, you know, put the, to the breasts to the side, my appearance and just realize I'm a human. My name's Jenny and I'm a woman and a femme identity. I, let's just start there. And, and I think when people get away from the silliness and the, in the, in the, the well, I just wanted to know questions, you know, and I'm going, well, that's the whole point is that why do you need to know? And would you ask a cis woman those same questions? Would you come up to a Swiss cis woman in your church that maybe just bought a really good Victoria's Seat push up bra and maybe look like she had a breast work and she's popping, you know, out of her dress a little bit on Sunday? Would you ask her if she just got a boob job? No, you you would do you would do that. In fact, you'd probably you probably get the 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 uh, stink eye from half the, the the congregation. And so, why would it be okay for you to ask me if I've had breast augmentation or if right. I've had classy three top? Yeah, you know, you know what, yeah. what does it matter what I have underneath my outfit. What what is what is your investment into my equipment unless you're romantically attracted to me and you're asking because you have interest now that's a different conversation and when i when i have people ask me about my parts that's when i pause and i go so are you asking because you find me attractive and your curiosity is driven by your attraction to me like you 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 see me as somebody you want to date or you're trying to be my friend and try to understand me. And if, if you're trying to be my friend and understand me, understand that asking what the sum of my parts are is not important in our friendship. Because I don't need to know what's under your dress either. Or your pants. To be your friend. I mean, like I, I don't need to know what you have in your pants. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That would be super inappropriate. Unless I said, hey, Jordan, I find you attractive and I would like to take you out on a date. And, it, 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 and then we have those type of discussions, you know, that possible people that are dating would ask each other, you know, on, on the more romantic or physical side. Mm -hmm. Or we just find out later on, you know, but, but either way, I think, I think people don't understand that they, they, from my perspective, they're like, well, I mean, if you are going to potentially date me, but I'd like to know that because it would be easier and it would make, maybe make the conversation a lot less awkward. You know, I, so I always want to know where the frame of interest is coming from as an ally because mm -hmm. it is unique from being gay or lesbian or something because there is a physical change or a possibility of a physical change.
change after we come out versus when if you come out as gay or bi or lesbian you're just announcing the world this is what i've always been but i've finally figured out or i'm willing to admit this is what i am to the world and it's a different coming out process and it's interesting you say that um there's two things that come to mind. One, when you talk about being open, uh, I just finished watching this really trippy series called uh, Midnight Gospel. And long story short, it's it's a, it's an animated series talking about philosophy in wacky situations, but they do touch on like serious themes. And one of them was about enlightenment and mindfulness and presence and kind of just being in the moment. Um, and so I think that is a, in terms of being open, I, I find the challenge more so being, being able to acknowledge even the vulnerabilities and the factors that keep you from being open to another perspective. And then, so then the question just becomes, well, how do you go past those, those barriers? How do you even identify it? Um, that's one thing but then another thing you brought up and and i really vibe with what you say about you know context matters so similar what similar thing when people ask me about my sexuality it's it one of the first things is like why do you want to know <laughs> um and because either that means you're interested or you have questions because you don't know or there's something more sinister that's going on. You're, you you want to judge me for something. Right. And a lot of people like, get on that third one. And so I, I, I get ready to bulk up. But, <laughs> um, it, but, but in all fairness, over time, I've gotten a lot more patient. <laughs> and a lot of the times I realize it's really more so because people just don't know how to engage. And so it's kind of interesting, you know, for sort of the person that educates people on on any aspect of their identity you know there's a little bit of, a little bit of patience that has to be there as well as even while i'm learning to be an ally like being okay with the realization that you're going to screw up you're going to do or say something ignorant or or inappropriate and that's fine someone will correct you yeah. <laughs> and you just learn adapt and that is so difficult sometimes because it's like you i guess the fear is like you know if i mess up then i'm a racist or if i mess up then i'm like whatever it is if i mess up i can recover from this i'll just forever be doomed it's like no we'll let you know and if you choose to keep doing we'll also let you know oh and a lot of but i think it's not taking like having that I'm sorry. I think a lot of it's just not taking it. A certain part of it is one of the reasons I ask those qu clarifying questions is sometimes to keep me from internalizing their message or, or taking it personal because a lot of it is out of just woeful ignorance because the majority of the public does not personally know a trans person. Like the statistic, I think, is 92% of the general public does not personally know or have an interpersonal friendship or relationship with a transgender person that they know of. Versus Makes sense. Gay, gay people, lesbians, almost everybody has a cousin or a friend or something like that. One, because it's a larger community. And two, it's just been more widely accepted for a longer period of time. Um, and so there's, there's more media archetypes, you know, Ellen DeGeneres, you know, uh, John, Elton John, we've had enough gay and lesbian people who are high profile on that now pop culture and in politics and, and somebody walks the life that we now go Anderson Cooper, prime example. I mean, you know, a generation ago, we would have never had an anchor that was gay and, and Dan Rather's prime time that would have never happened there would have never been an anderson cooper that tells you how far we've come the fact that nobody even questions doesn't even they don't even talk about his sexuality he's just anderson cooper and he works for cnn you know he's just he's just anderson cooper and it's not the gay man anderson cooper he's just anderson cooper 
And we're still with trans people like Caitlyn Jenner, Jazz Jennings. It's still trans pop star, trans cultural icon. Like they're still putting the adjective trans to our identities. And then they describe what we do. And then they use our name. So the trans is still at the top. Of it. It's still that hanging point. It's that barrier that you're talking about where they see my transness, my gender queerness. And it's like this, almost like a punch in the gut when I meet people. It's like the nice people don't want to say something wrong. Like they're, they're, they're just like, they're like deer in a headlight, you know, like you could just tell they're like carefully tiptoeing over their words. Like they're just, they're like, they know. And then if they accidentally use like the term dude, they already start over apologizing. I'm like, okay, dude, you're fine. Okay. I get it. Use dude to everybody. It's fine. You didn't come up to my face and start pointing my chest. Hey, dude, you just were using it as in, in, in a sentence. And, and it was a general, like, there's more of a stand here. It's no big deal. Like, we need to exclude, like, I'm not that fragile. So there's not a fragile sign on me. It says that I will break apart if you use the word dude in a sentence. And I happen to be wearing I don't, this is where you don't take what you are, one of your adjectives, so personally, because not everybody's out to get you. I'm 70% of the people I meet are automatically going to be my ally. I don't even have to win them over. It's that 30 radical conservative 30% this is where I've got to do the selling. Once somebody meets me, even if they're on the fence, they're okay because they just realize I'm just another human being. I can sell myself. But it's when you get into the you know, the Republican groups, the, the more conservative, where when they first meet you, you, you know, you got some work to do, you know, you know, it's, it's just like, as two people that visibly stick out in a lot of activism circles, where you being a person of color, you being a trans person, we're both visibly different. The moment we walk in a room, people can tell that we're different. We stick out in a room. Um, which has an advantage too. So being different also makes you memorable, marketable, marketable, and gets you indoors if you play your cards right in ways almost like a Trojan horse. And if you know your audience too. Yeah. Like, uh, like one of my close friends, diehard conservative Trump supporter, but he'll be hosting the most diverse panel of people and i like one of the most interesting people i've met through him was a black confederate supporter which i didn't know could exist and that was kind of like mind-blowing because even he was like yeah it's heritage i was like okay interesting <laughs> let's talk about that and, and then the conversations was fairly interesting like i remember one time we had uh I don't really want to call it a debate because it wasn't really so much as someone trying to prove a side as much as right. it was like exploration. Yeah. Um, but he, we were exploring each other's views about nationalism and territories between countries and immigration and just kind of sharing the perspective about why we even take the stance that we take. And, and it does boil down the personal stories, but even also information and other resources that we come across. And then we cross we cross reference, fact checked, and so on and so forth. So that's where we will challenge like where you get your resource. <laughs> but beyond as far as I like, believe, that's kind of like a sacred cow. Like we don't really try to convince each other. It's more of we just show where we are and why and then it's sort of like through that navigation we, we we really are able to communicate a little bit better as friends um so this is why again why i consider one of my closest friends for that so but yeah to your to your example and, and you you can that, that's how people can reach you know reach a consensus that that are maybe from different or polar opposite ideological belief system camps you know to where you know i think i think everybody can agree that certain things are important like education of kids clean air clean water i mean there's a lot of these things that we may not agree on how to fund it we may not agree on who should pay for it we may not agree 
we might argue the science from the fact that, hey, is it a reliable source? Like you said, is it really that polluted? Is it really, is it really that clean? Like we can we can debate the finite details, but we all are concerned about the environment. You know, without without air, without breathable oxygen, we're kind of in trouble. Um, without water, that's the, the water and air are two really big things. Um, you know, there's certain things that we can all agree on. Um, and, and, and it's the, it's the, what I call the fringe issues that may not be a fringe issue to somebody like, like a, a feminist, like a cisgender feminist that says, well, my reproductive rights aren't a fringe issue, but they are, it is a fringe issue from the fact that there's a lot of people that are divided on abortion. There's a lot of people divided on even reproductive health, like access to uh, family planning, like birth control, that sort of thing. Um, there's been court cases fought over, you know, Hobby Lobby versus the United States. I mean, or was it versus Texas? But it was, you know, there's been a lot of controversy on it. It's a, it's a controversy. It shouldn't be controversial. Just like me being trans and, and you know, I should be able to go to the bathroom I choose. But for some reason in 2016, North Carolina decided that they had a bathroom fetish, you know, and <laughs> they want to be the bathroom space, you know, like just we got all these really important issues going on and they're like, oh, out of the air, we'll just we'll just we'll just we're going to we're going to set the bathroom patrol. You know, it's just like are we in kindergarten again. <laughs> we're making sure people are not playing in the bathroom. It's just, it's just like it's it's just it's just you you almost want to look at somebody and go are you really an adult you know but i think it's bringing it back full circle i think it's about breaking down those barriers it's about meeting that black confederate and going i don't understand you i don't understand your stance per se but but i'm curious enough and i'm willing to make you feel safe enough and feel like that we both can occupy the same space, have a meaningful discussion that we don't have to leave as prom dates or, you know, or anything like that, but we can have a meaningful discussion to help maybe understand your existence and understand how this happened. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, I, you know, he's probably more rare than I am. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, and, and, and so, but he, he, he held on to those beliefs somehow. He somehow saw that as a, it was a very big part of his identity. And it was important to him, no matter how silly it seems to us. I seem silly to some people, too, when they meet me and they're like, you're a dude in a dress. And that's all you are. And that's all I see you as. Is how do you get past that? And it is identifying, like you said, is it a threat? Is it a romantic? Is it, is it they're just ignorant, but they're teachable? And identifying, should I be nervous in this situation or can I continue and, and start creating a safe space for each party that's in the discussion and not poo-pooing people's beliefs. And it's really hard to do because one of my co-hosts um, on coffee uh, is, she is a progressive on most things, except she is Latinx. And she's very, very, she says she's pro-life, but she's really pro-birth is what she is. And, and she is very, very, because of her religious beliefs, she's very, very pro-life. And it's tough because everybody else who we usually have is pro-choice, you know. And so, and all of all of our hosts, she's the only one that's that's staunchly pro-life of the four hosts. And so, it's it's a very awkward thing because that discussion does come up, um, you know, especially because she knows I'm part of a feminist organization. You know, it's like, you know, we could. And, and, and when we do the show in real time, we actually literally sit by each other. So it's it, it's very it's very awkward. But she struggles with LGBT things too. She had never really been around a trans person until me until I started doing the show. She struggled. She struggled with pronouns. She struggled with even though the producer of our show and our main host, he's gay. He's married to a man. We shoot the show in his house, but he's also Latinx. 
So he is family to her in that way. Um, and here I am, a white, visibly queer trans woman <laughs> coming in, you know, on a ba- basically a Latinx talk show. Um, because I'm good friends with Christian that started the show out of his house. And um, I think part of it is that she's never been around somebody that queer. Like, Christian's kind of mellow about it at times, whereas, you know, I, the way I dress, the way I act, I'm flaming. I know I'm flaming. I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know... I know that I put it on. I'm a, I'm a lot, uh, you know, and, and it's intentional. The way I dress is intentional on um, one, because I love the way I dress. I love the edgy look, the alt look. Um, but two, just like our differences of who, I, who we are, Jordan and myself is that we are visibly different. So I go, why not take it to the nth degree? Why not give the shot value? To, to celebrate that, you know, yeah. I met, I was fortunate to um, meet Daniel Lismore, who's a fashion stylist in London and uh, uh, for H&M, and he's also a designer for himself, but uh, he's known, or I'm sorry, they're known to be, um, to have like these most exotic, wild, like sort of ornaments all over their body. They're already tall. They're like six five, six six, wow. and and has done all kinds of charity work. So they collect artifacts as gifts that people give as gifts for helping out with different groups. It's like he has a he has a gauntlet from a suit of, from a centuries old suit of armor. He has some old uh, artifacts from like the the Ming Dynasty. So it he had uh, they have all these wild like sort of artifacts and objects that they wear as daily accessories and i asked them why and they were like well i was already tall and i was a model at the time and people kept staring at me i was like well if you're going to keep staring at me i might as well put on a show (laughs) i really love that uh we even based the whole exhibition off their message which was like be yourself because everyone else is taken and, and it was just on brand. I was like, you know, that actually makes a whole lot of sense. Like, own it. Just yeah. own it. You know, and I learned two of those lessons. So when I first started, my therapist posted this, and she called it a trans camp, where she newly, uh, newly out of the closet, trans people, trans women and trans men predominantly, she had one night of just styling tips, one night of the law, one night of that, you know. And so there was five nights to this camp. And we just came to her office and we'd have about an hour, two hours of just whatever. And um, one of them was a, one of the guests was a styling guru for women. And she was this six foot, six foot Wayne model that super tall. Short boy K, very square jawline, looked trans. Honestly, she came off as trans, genderqueer, and she wasn't. She's completely cis. And she wore heels, and I'm, I'm talking about four or five inch pumps. Like, like I mean, I'm talking about intense show stopping heels. And she wore them on a daily basis in her, in her regular muggle life. And she said, you know, I'm here to teach y'all to own fashion styles and not keep people from poo-pooing what you want to do. She said, a lot of people are going to tell you, give you this friendly advice. Oh, you're tall anyway. You shouldn't wear heels. You should play that down. You should downplay your existence. You should wear baggy clothes so so people can't see your squared off lines. She said, not all women, because she was very athletic and very boxy shaped too. That was another reason I thought she was trans. I was like, God, she's done some great voice work because her voice sounds so sick. I was like, this is incredible. And yeah. I was almost dis- almost broken hearted to the fact that she was cis in a certain way. I mean, but I was like, I was like, but here's this six foot tall, accomplished, confident woman that says, yeah, there's sometimes I, you know, do, do do I question my look? But she says, it's my look. I own it. And um, and her husband was like six foot seven. Like, And Zach was just the sweetest guy in the world. But um, 
they were just these huge LGBT allies and friends of my therapist. And uh, because he came on as the styling guru for um, the trans men, you know, and, and, you know, because even stuff like our walk, our talk, our body language, she said, you know, think about what you want because you can reimagine whatever you want. She says, this is the cool thing is you got to do over um, by, you know, opening up your true identity to the world. You also have a chance to do a reboot. And even my therapist, about seven or eight months in, I was telling her, because I was when I started first transitioning, I wore predominantly like regular fabric dresses and, you know, cloth leggings and stuff. Just very, very, I wouldn't say conservative, but they were definitely more what, you know, you'd see any other cis woman wear kind of but she said, well, what did you dress like when you lived as a male? So I wore a lot of leather. I wore a lot of edgy stuff. I wore a lot of flamboyant colors. My style at times was very out there. And she goes, well, what's keeping you from doing that now? I said, absolutely nothing, I guess. And from that point on, I started interchanging. You know, I went and got a pair of cheap faux leather leggings from Dillard's that were on sale for like 10 bucks and just started... My wardrobe went from this almost like housewife type existence to being the person and and realizing that that was, that was my BDSM edgy look that I had before. Why am I not interpreting that as, as a woman? What what was that barrier? What was what what was a self created barrier that the I can blame it on the outside world, but really they weren't taking out my clothes for me. I was. And I was building a new wardrobe. Why am I making choices? Because I think I'm going to get acceptance. When she looked at me and said, you're always going to be trans. That's always going to be your history. You're always going to have some edges. There are going to be edges of masculinity, no matter how many surgeries you get. She said, but that's your advantage. That is your secret sauce. She said, look at some of the most beautiful cis women models in the world. How boyish they look. And fun fact, everyone, cis and trans, has energies from both gender. <laughs> uh, that, was uh, uh, huh? that was her next point, actually, was, you know, everybody floats the gender river a little bit. She says, just like the yeah. second one, she said, I don't care how straight the man is. Every man has a man crush, a celebrity man crush, that they would dip into the penis pond if given the opportunity, like if it was Jason Momoa or The Rock or whoever. So it's funny you say that because there's like another aspect. So when I was still in I'm trying to understand my own sexuality, I came across this documentary that broke up attraction in different segments. And for me, I I can process things better when I compartmentalize them, like just kind of break it apart, digest it bit by bit and then reassemble it. And so when I was still figuring myself out, I, how they explained it was that attraction is, they broke it down to two factors, romantic attraction, which is the love, all the, all the, go, all the goopy stuff. And then there's just sexual and that there are validated aspects of bisexuality where someone can be attracted to the same sex romantically, but attracted to the opposite sex sexually, or vice versa, attracted yeah. to the same sex sex, but attracted to the opposite sex uh, romantically. And that was my case. And so you, you have people that even defy even those, you know, because the in all frankness, these are all relatively new things that, and when I say new, I mean our culture is now starting to really look into what this really is, because before the 21st century, it was just, oh, they're just people that are like that, or, you know, this is right, this is wrong, and there's just going to be people that do right and wrong things. And it's like, they kind of put a, a kind of stop to that. And it's like, no, now we're in an age where, well, no, there's some nuances here that we really need to investigate and really need to right. look into and understand. And so, um, and, and to, again, going back to the joke slash, you know, observation that, you know, everybody has both, both ends, so to speak. 
there's a first of all we're completely haven't even talked about intersex yet which i need to figure out how to do uh how to put that into the show but um there's this doctor that i saw on youtube that was he did this whole seminar for this group of medical professionals uh, uh in terms of the medicine side of helping patients in their transitions regardless of their age and a part of his conversation and what was interesting i was, I was a little skeptical at first because i was like i don't know where we're going with this and we're already using science to prove a certain biased conclusion regardless of what polarity but afterwards it did make me feel better so what he was arguing was that sex itself like the how the body is formed is a spectrum first of all intersex people but even secondly even if you know the the factory equipment is developed so to speak you do get anomalies you do get other facial features you do get and that's just a matter of the balance of influence between your x and y chromosomes and you know you and and you also do get those and i don't want to call them anomalies but you do get those occurrences where um i think it's like double double x y or like something in your chromosomes yeah. where you do get and with that look very much like men or you get men that are very feminized and you also get situations where um you're kind of in that in between space like there was one case study where there was a woman that had uh one of her ovaries was actually a testicle and so it's like you you do come across those things and not only that but some of that also factors into pollution the chemicals and whatever else we we as a society have consumed uh, and, over the time period also and argued it, like go ahead even even biodiversity like this has been one of my fundamental so when I get somebody that is against the LGBT, like they, they like they are let's say they're fundamentally Christian and they they go, Well, God doesn't make mistakes. And I'm going, Well, let me reverse it on you. So if God being all powerful, for example, you believe that he's omniscient or they are omniscient and all powerful maybe i'm not a mistake but i'm part of his plan because how could god make a million different species of fish and birds and biodiversity of all kinds and just all the animal genomes and even human beings look at all the different skin colors and eye colors and hair and textures and heights and all that and how could that not be the case with sexuality and in gender both the gender in our brain, our hardwiring in our brain, our brain's so complicated, scientists still don't understand it. How well, can was, yeah. all those moving parts, with yeah. all, the, all these people marrying into different, you know, family trees, how could we not have biodiversity of sexuality and gender? Right. And to that point, uh, the same same medical the same researcher had um, also found there was a there was a few study a few years ago there was an, another study and I remember it because it was a conversation for another situation but um, in around 2015 2016 there was a medical study that came out that after a series of tests for a number of people um, they concluded that the male and female brains are actually wired in a specific way, which further verified, like, again, kind of the same thing that our support groups do when we when we go to support group, you know, when someone tells you who they are, believe them, because, yeah, that you, the evidence will show. <laughs> and so, and the guy said it the same way, you know, if, a, if, oh, if someone who looks like a woman tells you they're a man, believe them, because likely is if you scan their brain and it's a male brain, they were right. <laughs> like, yeah. There's there's some truth to the whole I'm a insert gender trapped in a another gender body. So right. it I just thought that was very or yeah. So I thought that was very fascinating. Um, and then as far as there's one other thing I want to kind of loop back uh, real quick, you know, and, and talk of all of this. So in terms of being open, in terms of uh, kind of p taking out your own barriers, but both and then slowly taking off the barriers of the other. 
Uh, all of this, I think, at some point has to play into mental and mental health. And you mentioned at the very beginning, you know, you went, you sort of settled that first before you settled anything else. And I kind of want, wanted you to kind of speak on that more, especially more so in the sense of, you know, mental health advocacy. And uh, I want to ask you what hardships did you come over? I don't think that's appropriate anymore. So I think the more appropriate question is, in what ways has seeking a counselor helped you in this whole journey and sort of settling your mental health, um, however it may be? Um, and what, what was the whole thing like? I, you know, for me, the counseling was, was twofold. One, the my non-trans issues were in the mix, that they were there, they were up bubbling on the surface. In fact, true story, I did not tell my there I began therapy in May of 26, the, the, the psychological side of it. And I did not tell my therapist about my assault until the end of December of 2016. Mm. I knew it was there. I did not want to talk about it. I wasn't ready to unpack it because, I mean, I spent probably the first six or seven sessions because I was going weekly at the beginning. I was going to a therapist every week. I was unpacking so much. You know, there was so much trauma there. Um, just being in the closet, fighting the deal. Um, I didn't have the energy to go over the, the really, the really bad stuff in a certain way. So I wanted to attack the audience. And that's what her specialty was, was LGBT counseling and was one of the preeminent counselors. And so attacking that gave me the baseline to be able to unpack the other stuff, the traumas. The, my brother passing away in 2003, my assault and these internalized you know, struggles with relationships, these struggles with so many things that were those parts of my journey along the way, you know, and finding out how to make those, pull those pieces of the puzzle out and then try to put them back in in a safe way to the new person. And because they're never leaving you, I will always be a sexual assault survivor. That's going to change. I'm always going to be a trans woman because I was assigned male at birth. That's never, I can't, I can't erase that. That happened. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's like, it, 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 it'll bring us back to the previous point about religion versus biology, science, biological science. In this way, this is going to sound really weird. I agree with the most extreme right wing Christians on this. In God made me intentional, if you believe in God, which I don't, but I'm going to go with, if your God's all-powerful and has this amazing recipe book for making everything in the, in the universe, why would you limit your God to not be able to make women with women's brains have the stem on the apple? Why is that impossible? And why is it that wrong? There's no real morality on a woman born with a penis. Right. So you, what we're doing is matching morality for the fact that of our reproductive, which goes back to feminism, which goes back to our place in society, which is why we create these morality codes in the first place is to tell us how to behave, tell us to obey the governments and all the local authorities and the Pope and everything else. So if we unpack all that colonial, colonist mentality, they were not slaves of the Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Empire and the Spanish crown, the British crown and all that. We pull all that fuckery out. And I did say fuckery. And we just go, God and whatever God you pray to and science can line up. Both of them can prove that I was made this way. God has the power to make me a female brain human being with a penis. God don't make junk. I've heard preachers say that over and over again. One of my favorite preachers is a metropolitan community church preacher back in Amarillo, Texas. And he's this 
70-year-old African-American from New Jersey. Mil grew up as a military brat. And um, he, he, his mom knew he was gay before he, he was he was gay. And she said, honey, you're fine the way you are. We're talking about, late, he graduated high school in like the late 1960s. And she said, God, don't make junk. You're perfect the way you are. I see the way you look at other men. We knew me and my sisters. You were a gay child for a long, long time, and, and he, she said even your uncle Willie knew. My brother, your uncle Willie, knew you were gay. We all knew you had sugar in the tank. It's okay. And from then on, and then he just didn't hide his sexuality anymore. And to hear Pastor Bernie say this is just deal. But he says, and he and he's also a uh, he worked for uh, Exxon for years, and then after he retired, he went back and went into the ministry to help his community and um he said he said god don't make junk and neither does science and he said they're both right he said he said if you want to get your genitals reassigned you can but he says know that if you want to keep your genitals the way you were born as that's okay too you're still a woman because god god didn't make a mistake and so that revolutionary idea, because when I first started transitioning, I was hell bent on getting bottom surgery. And it was one of my burning things. And about 10, 11 months in, after I had unpacked my being sexually assaulted and going through so many things and understanding my sexuality versus my gender and all that, I backed off. Another reason why I backed off surgery is because I was like, I need to make sure my brain's right before I get all this so cause if you get your genitals reassigned, I sound like taking a sweater back to the store, to the, the to the JC Paints. You know, <laughs> once that's done, that ship is sailed, you know. I mean and I said, Am I uncomfortable because I'm a woman with a penis, or is society uncomfortable with me being a woman with a penis? Good question. Yeah. Fair and question. So does our is it gender dysphoria that drives, drives that internally or does society drive our gender dysphoria because we're supposed to look a certain way because all cis women are supposed to be five foot six and they're supposed to be this weight and this look. And, you know, because cis women go through this too where we're, it's where a lot of these eating disorders drive are driven from because they're not a size six or a size four or they're not this or they don't have perfect boobs or you know it's why a lot of these women have these obsessions with cosmetic procedures is because they're on their 50th procedure because they, the society keeps telling them and they keep internalizing that they're not perfect when perfection's impossible and who decides what's perfect who the fuck decides i think i'm perfect the way i am and well, if, I, you know, if i want to lose weight i'm losing weight because I want to be healthier. I want to look better in my swimsuit. But I'm perfect at the starting point. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm perfect. I'm hot. I'm wearing yeah. latex overalls. I'm a sporty looking girl. I'm athletic as fuck. And I was born with a penis. Okay. And that's cool. And, and it's cool. And a friend of mine had mentioned about, you know, talk about dysphoria. He had mentioned that everyone has, he argues that everyone has dysphoria in some form or another. And I can kind of see that um, regardless of what you identify as. Because even for cisgender male, and I know for me growing up, I did not check all the boxes for being masculine. And uh, that that really got to me for a while and I got picked on for it. And so, you know, I would think about, oh, well, how do I get rid of these man boobs? Like, how do I how do I turn these in the pecs? How do I like trim my waist, trim my waistline down? How do I get this triangular shape from the broad shoulders, but then the little waist? It's like and yeah. everyone kind of goes to those shenanigans to some degree or another, because, yeah, culturally, we're always the identities that we whether we choose it or whether it was given to us or whether we kind of stumbled into it, they're always challenged, you know? I remember growing up being told, you know, be a man, which was more so along the lines of like, don't cry, don't be open to your emotions. Um, 
you know, don't, don't act off your impulses or just be tough. And that, yeah, I, it's absurd, but that was, that was sort of the challenges of that time. And, you know, part, and going back to what you said earlier about allies and kind of like learn the basics and one of the biggest things, and you had mentioned earlier, you know, you were curious about why I'm doing this. And so a lot of it is the biggest thing I got out of this whole experience and still I'm getting out of this whole experience is being able to learn what a real ally is. Because outside of the undocumented immigrant community when I was an undergrad, the transgender community has been like, since then, the, the transgender community and advocating for for this community has really been the like the second form of real allyship I've ever been. Every other time, it's usually someone else is being an ally, and half the time I'm kind of skeptical of like, why are you an ally, and why are yeah. you advocating for people who look like me? <laughs> like, what do you? What's your angle? What do you get out of it? And yeah. and I ha- and I check myself on that regularly. Because uh, I have to ask myself, you know, and I'm asked constantly, you know, well, what made you want to do this? The answer is consistent. And for me, it's like, as long as that consistency is there, I think I'm in the right place. And, you know, um, and for that, because I don't think I ever told you. So there was a saying from Martin Luther King that if there's injustice for one of us, it's injustice for all of us or something along the lines of that. Yeah. And so that sticks with me. Secondly, being someone who was bullied, and then as I learned about more discriminations against people of color or immigrants or women or LGBTQ2IPK plus, you name it, um, to me, that's just another form of bullying. This is bullying on the adult version. And so, yeah, I'm ready to throw it out. Yeah. Um, you know, in 2016, when the Black Lives Matter movement was was escalating and getting to its peak, you know, I wanted to go out to the streets and march and protest. And a couple of times I did for the Women's March. But um, a friend of mine had done this series called In Honor, which was um, it was his attempt on on participating without taking to the streets. And I liked that concept about how do I use what I'm gifted at and what I'm passionate about and what I'd rather set my life out to be, which is in the arts, how do I use that as a force to then participate in this kind of conversation? And so, you know, he did it for for the African-American community and I want to do it for other communities that I relate to. And that was the other thing. So not that I relate to, other communities that I believe are being discriminated. But in that process, I realize and learn and still am realizing these universal, relatable human experiences, regardless of your labels. You know, everybody's felt pain, everybody bleeds, everybody cries, um, and everybody gets disadvantaged at some point or disenfranchised or is stereotyped and misrepresented. Um, And so my, you know, I'm more concerned about, okay, well, where are those problems? Where are those unique issues that this particular group of people are having that needs a unique set of solutions? And let's talk about that. Um, So uh, a lot of what I do in general, whenever I advocate for anybody, it really comes from those. Um, So with that, thank you so much for all that you've done doing and are currently planning to do. Um, If there's any way I can help, please let me know. You know, you know, you're, you're actually, you know, whenever I look at a new project, especially involving the LGBT community or anything artistic, you're one of those names I always think of first. It's, it's like you and, um, um, gosh, I'm blanking on her name. I can see her face. The one that does the dirty laundry project. Um, um, oh my, I know who you're talking about and I need to reach out to her. Um, Cause she was at T-Door, right? No, she was at, yeah, yeah she, she was either at T- T-Door. Yeah, no, she was at T-Door because we didn't have to have. Um, okay. Yeah, she was at T-Door because she was the one doing the little thing off to the side ramp. And, mm-hmm. and it, and it kind of had you in that same space. So that's that's where I introduced you. Yeah. 
Andrea. I don't know how yeah. I can't remember her name. I actually dated yeah. it. Andrea. And um, people like that that are pure allies that are that are that are the moment I met her and the moment I met you. Actually, I met y'all really close together. I met you in the same month. I both met both of y'all in December of 2018, ironically. Um, oh. In fact, it meant the same week um, because I met Andrea at the first national organization mixer that I went to in December. They had their holiday party, open mic night. That, that was what they do in December. And then I think it was, in, I think the next Sunday was the second Sunday. And that's when I met you. I met two very artistic, influential allies that have been in my life ever since then. There's never been a time where where I, I, I felt that y'all were out of my life, you know, to where we we run in the same circles. Where it, he's a hardcore um you know, uh, women's act, act activist and LGBT activist. She did a thing at Pride. She, you know, like she is constantly. Um, cause she does Zoom calls twice a month now, and I sit on most of those on Sundays. And like she has friends, she has uh, um, friends as part of the project and now in Germany. They're from Charlotte, but they one one of them the lesbian couple and one of them got transferred to Germany. So now they live in Germany, but she's known them for known these two for years and it's all over now. It's just, it's, the project is really blowing up in a great way, but she's made it so relatable in your project with the trans community has been so relatable and your intentions is what I like the intentionality to go by it because you sincerely want to hear the stories. You sincerely want to be involved in the in the places that that really help seeing a cis black man take interest in our community the way you did is a cool intersection because you don't see it that often. You see a lot of cis white women, a lot of cis white progressive women saying, I want to be that, you know, kind of like the the gay guys always have that female, you know, friend, you know, and they got a terrible term for it, but I don't like using the term, but, but every gay guy has at least one of those friends and, you know, but it's really unusual to see a man of color be so heavily strong and pure of heart ally as you are. And it's very unique. It's also very empowering because the African American community so much struggles with the LGBT, and the Black church is so powerful in that community, and most Black churches are not comfortable with LGBT people, and and because I've experienced it myself when I went to the Black Caucus thing last summer, and some of the older Dinkins, you could tell when I got introduced to them, they'd rather chew off their arm than shake my hand, like literally two of them refused to shake my hand. Oh, wow. I think you did tell me. Yeah, you told yeah. me this before. And oh, yeah. I, I just took it in stride because I was with a lot of political friends and people running for office. And I was like, you know, but one of the younger deacons, it was right to my left, put his hand out real quick and shook my hand and then mouthed the words, I'm sorry. And I was like, it's okay. This is their home. Like, I'm, I'm a guest in their home. I'm in this church. We're, we're here at this political thing. And it is what it is. And goes, yeah, but it shouldn't be that way. And I'm like, but but because of people like you, the next generation, it doesn't have to be that way. This is a formative moment for you, too. And thank you for your kind words. And I think, and this is, this is why I think, you know, these next generations of the millennials and generations, you see these changes in, even in specific communities like the Latinx community, the African American community, the Asian, the different Asian communities. As you're starting to see communities be, as a community um, become more accepting, and we won't just have to rely on the 60 and up liberal white women <laughs> to raise hell, even though you should always, every protest you go to, 
you need to take an old white woman with you because they won't bust up the protest. Yeah. Old white women there. Because those women are the ones that decide how votes go down. Is take an old white woman and, and, and maybe one or two of her old black friends that run all the black political caucuses because they won't hurt old women. They won't hurt old white women and old black women. They just won't. They won't. They yeah. won't. The cops won't. Now they'll they'll kick the crap out of a trans woman. They'll kick the crap out of a black guy. Um, you know, and, and, and we've seen with I recently. Old, old women, they, they get a pass. You, yeah. you got to take, take a Melba Evans with you or, or a Constance Johnson or, or somebody like that, you know. And just go, I'm going to protest here but because I'm a trans woman and I'm visibly queer. I need to take me about four or five 50 to 70 year old women with me. <laughs> just keep yeah. them around. Because those cops won't touch me then. Because they know all those old white women have got the brand new phones and they'll record that shit and they'll call the mayor personally and, and they'll be hitting them with their purses and, and praying for them. And, and the end of the have you seen Selma, the scene with, with uh, Oprah in it? First yeah. of all, the scene that has Oprah as a character, she has always beat someone's ass. It, first yeah. of all, that I find out. So secondly, but yeah, you find yourself in Oprah. That's the, that's the moral yeah. of the story. Grab you Old know. black or white lady that will mess you up <laughs> if you cross them. Because if they've Even got if they that age and they're still relevant and politically powerful... Oh, of yeah. any deal, let me tell you, nothing will make a, a especially a male politician's butthole talker and worrying about a lobby full of old women in, in, in their office waiting to get after them. That'll scare. True story, I got in a very heated verbal discussion with a Texas state senator. And uh, Amarillo Indivisible. And um, I waited to the very end, and it was a surprise because being a Republican, it was real rare that he was coming in, but they got him to come to this Indivisible Q&A. And they were all asking really softball questions, and he was dodging them like he was in the Matrix or something like that. But I had a question that was between him and I that no, if he lied about it, I had the proof that he was lying. And if he told the truth, then it would have been an awkward moment for him. Either way, he was not going to win. It was it, it was an ambush on my part, and it was it was purposeful because of what went down the year before with the trans or bathroom bill that he voted for. And I'd gone down there for Tex, Texas Transgender Lobby Day, and um, the next day was the hearing on this bathroom bill. And one of the things on lobby days, you went to your local senator and representative. So I went to. Kell's office, and he was there. He actually saw us because I was with a very politically powerful older trans woman that also lived in my area. And they saw us, and she waved to Kell and said, "Hey, Kell." And Kell knew my he ate in my mom's restaurants. My mom was a very well known chef and restaurant tour in the Panhandle of Texas, so he knew who I was. He mm -hmm. he knew who my mom was, and he immediately went back into his. And we signed in, so we'd like to see Kel. Is he busy? And the aide went back there, and they came back and said, well, he's busy on a conference call. And we're like, okay. Well, we put out all of our numbers. Just have him call us or text us while we're in town. We're all going to be here through at least Wednesday morning. Not one peep, not one email, nothing from him forever. Of course, I had pictures of this that we'd signed in. Um, I'd snapped a little bit of a picture of him in the office, I had it stored in my cloud. And uh, in that meeting, I said, Nikel, when I ask you this question, realize that I have the proof that, that I'm right. But I'm going to ask you, I went down to your office and I named off the date. And I said, I signed in. You saw us there. I was with Sandra Dunn. And uh, I'm Jenny Gunn. I'm the daughter of. And, and he knew who my mom was. Immediately, his eyes lit up. He was like, oh, yeah, no, I know. Clearly. And I was like, why didn't you follow up with me? as a constituent, I live in your district. I live in your Senate district. Why as a citizen and the daughter of a prominent landowner and commercial investor in this district, 
why did you not follow up with me? And my mom also sent you an email and you didn't answer my mom either. So I just want to know. And he goes, he started, first he started, well, man, it's a clerical mistake or whatever. And then he realized he was caught. Because I said, and then I reminded him, I said, Kel, I do have the answer on my phone that you didn't do it. I said, so, and then he goes, well, sir, I'll be sir, he misgendered me. And of course, this is a room full of predominantly white and black, older, progressive women that's in this, in this uh, indivisible amarillo. And then he goes, she's a ma'am, she's a woman. And just screaming up, they were going to kill him. They literally, and I was the voice of the room, and I was like, y'all need to calm down. I want him to answer the question. And then he got all red in the face because he's an old, balding, white woman. And he started getting red in the face lynching around and he said well this is just an ambush and you're just trying to discredit me i said no kel i just asked you a question that you couldn't lie about without getting in trouble i said everybody else has been throwing you softball questions i said I have one more about school finance he goes well i'm not going to answer any more of your questions in fact he started taking off his microphone and said i'm just done here and he stormed off and left of course everything that happened in that meeting including our exchange was caught on they videotaped every meeting and they wanted to really the press and and i said you know that doesn't really serve a purpose we all know he's an animal we all know him and get along um i made my point he may never come back to y'all's meetings um but i left an impression on him that's good enough maybe that'll give him pause the next time he votes on an lgbt bill who knows maybe that's the eye opener that was needed but if, if nothing else Someone's going to get voted in. <laughs> Someone well, different will be voted. I already made a decision with my senators. I wrote to them about the uh, net neutrality issue oh. when that was a thing. And I got this passive-aggressive letter, and I was like, okay, so you basically told me you're taking the money over the people, and you just told me to F off. Well, I'm voting yeah. blue now. <laughs> <laughs> just for that alone. Yeah, it's it's it's... You know, and, and, and these people, even if they don't agree, like, and I wasn't even debating Kel on an issue. I was just debating, hey, I just need you to come com- clean in front of all these people because you've been avoiding me for a little over a year. Like, it was almost, it was like about 13 months of the date from when I was in his office. And he just literally didn't even give me the human decency. And at first he did gender me right. And... And, and then when he got pissed off, of course, he, you know, he went to misgendering me and getting all indignant, you know, just froth in the mouth. It basically act like Kavanaugh did on the, on the stand when he was, you know, trying to bring him as a Supreme Court judge. He acted just like that. I mean, froth in the mouth. Just, so, oh, my gosh, I can't even believe you're making me clutch my pearls in front of all these people. You know, how dare you, peasant, you know, and I, and I think. That's one of the things that does drive my activism so much is how public servants believe there there are rulers. When every time they come up for election, going for a job interview, and how our dynamic shifted, and I think it's all about looking at whether it's viewing your eye, viewing myself through the eyes of a believer, like someone that's a Christian or Islamic or Jewish. And and trying to put myself in their shoes, like, and relate it to what they believe and say, okay, I take you at your word that you believe that God created all the fishes in the sea and all that. So let's flip the dynamic. If you answer, well, God can't make a trans person, then you're going, well, then your God ain't all powerful and all knowing and all omniscient. Then some <laughs> got the recipe to humans when he made me. So if you believe God made everything, and he's the alpha no male. Then all of a sudden, what did he that day? He left a little left salt out of my out of my out of the cocktail that made me. You know, I mean, <laughs> what did he just have a bad hair day or something? I mean, like, I mean, you know, it's funny when people put human qualities to deities. Like, it's inconceivable for some starch, staunch right wing Christian of any of any faith. Of, uh, I mean, of any denomination of Christianity, when they get far right, when they can't picture God making somebody queer, whether it's gender or sexuality, they're like, well, God can't make gay people. I'm like, well, why can't he? He's all powerful. Right. Like, everybody's got a man. And, 
And he was talking about is the dogma, just getting yeah. into the dogma and the religion more than the relationship with the divine, yeah. with the Lord. Oh, and I, at least on my end, I want to end on the note that, you know, remember, God and angels and any other spirit technically don't have a sex. They're non-binary. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's like, keep that in mind. But yeah. anyway. All of our spirits are, we all are a cocktail of the stars. We're all made out of stardust somehow. And the building blocks for everything on this planet is 4 billion years old, or however old this planet is. And we're all made from that. Everything we breathe in is 4 billion years old. There's nothing new here. So it's just recycled. We're all recycled out of poop and carbon and trees and and whatever gunk is in our atmosphere and everything else we're all a sum of whatever ten dollars worth of chemicals is in us that makes us who we are because that's all we are is about ten dollars worth of chemicals and water 80 percent water so all that cocktail of genome and and every toxin and everything else is in us right now and that's what makes us unique. That's what, you know, we've seen gender variance and sexual variance throughout history. We've had, Ro we had a Roman emperor that was a trans woman that was married to a man that ruled, I think, for nine years as a woman and took a, a male, a cis male husband and was an empress and um, lived as a woman, used a female name. And um, we, we, I mean, you know, Jesus, no doubt, as many followers as he's had, there was no way, because especially in the Mediterranean where he lived, there were a ton. I mean, gayness in the Roman Empire, which he lived in, was very common. Like, bisexuality, gay, um, lesbian, like, people were just people. You picked who your mate was. There was not this weird construct of the, of the Holy Roman Catholic Church at that time. So, I'm... Um, and most cultures in the world, bisexuality and gayness and, and all that, it's not a thing. It's just, it's, we don't care. You know, just don't burn down my house. I won't burn down your house and, and, and we're cool. So, you know, I think when we get into where we start assigning morality to things that aren't immoral, you know, stealing from your neighbor, that's probably immoral. You know, that loses trust. Me going to a doctor, a licensed professional, to get hormones or therapy or whatever, that relationship's only between me and my doctor. What does yeah. it matter what I wear? What does it matter if I grow my hair out? What does it matter if I grow boobs? What, why is that affecting you so much? You have to ask yourself why it bothers you, why it makes you question your faith, why you won't bake me a cake so I can marry my husband. You know, I mean, like, what makes you not hate me so much? What is in you to fear being in the same spaces with me? What is that barrier that's keeping you from accepting me as just your neighbor? Just your random queer neighbor. And what does it matter? And so... You know, would I address conservative people that I know are on the other end of the spectrum? I'm like, in your Bible, it says, love thy neighbor. As yourself. As yourself. And I think that's what trips them up because they're going, how could I love myself as a queer? And going, you don't have to. You just have to remove the judgment and say, it doesn't matter what adjectives you put next to them, at the end of the day, we're all related and we're all human. So what does it matter? What does it matter? You know, and, um, well, I actually, no, it just left my mind, which tells me I should probably digress. Jenny, <laughs> I actually don't have any more questions. Okay. The only thing I would have is the only message or of all that we've talked about, if it hasn't been spoken of yet, what message would you want to project out there for people past our lifetime, past through space and time? Uh, what would you want? What message would you want them to hear from you? Um, 
Gal love. Um. <laughs> You gotta love four people in your life. Um, the first one that you have to love to learn and give compassion and kindness to is people like you, people that will agree with you, people that are your family, your friends, your allies, your loved ones, the ones that are easy to love. You still gotta love them, no matter how bad of a day they have. You gotta love people that are not like you. But don't think like you. Don't pray to the same God that you do. That don't vote the same way. That don't. Um, that are um, just different. You gotta love them too. You've got to learn to love strangers. Automatically be open and kind and compassionate to them because you don't know what they've been through. And the fourth thing. <laughs> This is the toughest one. You gotta love yourself. You got to be compassionate and kind to yourself because if you don't do that, you can't do the other three people. It'll never happen. And then this whole exercise of walking this planet is for naught. It's nothing. You can get all the cute outfits and cars and there with that and you can be on the cover of magazines but there's one four letter word that can never be bought and it can never be replaced and can never be broken if it's true and those four people you have to love in your lifetime and learn to love those people in your lifetime and that's it that's all you need to know Thank you for those words. I really appreciate that. And then lastly, um, this isn't an official thing, but I feel like it's kind of important. So, uh, and I always keep forgetting to do it in the beginning. So the pronouns are, is him. And may I ask what your pronouns are? My, I have two pronouns. I go by she, her, and they, them. Really appreciate that, Jenny. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now let me go ahead and turn off this recording.